program the radio. They just did a full reset and everything we had originally. The hardware side. And uh, Dave, I mean, uh, Bob Davis uh, on the mechanical side. Bob doesn't want to admit to working with that, but I don't think so. We're, we're glad to have him. And uh, we sort of borrowed him from uh, the box program. That, Bob is a very busy guy, so it's very hard to do that. Uh, it is time that he's done a great job of helping us. Um, and yeah, this power supply has four uh, voltage outputs for the game, 13.8, six, and it has four USB uh, ports on it. So it, we're looking forward to future systems that might uh, use these USB ports. Uh, in fact, there's one already that's been talked about that requires so much power that they have to plug into two of the USB ports. So uh, we're trying to look to the future, and this hopefully this power supply will be able to supply all that. Um, and this is we get down to the uh, the nuts and bolts here, really. Uh, this power supply has so many interlocks. Uh, hopefully, it will protect it from ever uh, finding a, a case where it causes smoke or anything. Uh, first thing it does is we, we limit the power, the current coming in, and uh, we also limit the current that's going out the pastor, we, we've added a feature to this power supply that uh, no one else has done for the ISS that I know of. Uh, when, you, when you take up a power outlet, you plug us in, we have an identical connector that uh, you can plug, plug in another system if you need it to operate from that outlet. So we essentially try to not take up the outlet to, keep it from being used. So uh, that will, will enable them to run an experiment or something they need to without taking up uh, their spot. So we also have the same current limiting on 28 and the same overload protection. Uh, we have uh, EMI filters on every input. Uh, the, 20, the 120 volt has to withstand a pulse of over 350 volts uh, and still not damage it and keep on, keep on trucking. So that's a little hard to do, but we've managed to do it. Uh, Terry Banky has done a fantastic job. Uh, any of you know him, he's, he's an amazing person. Uh, anyhow, we have protection on every outlet, every place we send out power, we have limits. And uh, if you overload one of them, it sets to zero, and you can turn it back on by re resetting the power off and back on. Uh, USB ports, uh, of course, stand for just like any other commercial USB ports. Uh, big thing here is I want to show you these pictures. This is the first flight flight light unit. Uh, has all the features that built exactly like the flight ones will be. This is the one we will use for all our EMI tests. As you can see, we have switches for for every output. It's another picture of it. From the outlet side, that's the input side. This is a uh, switches from the uh, you turn on the converter on and off. That all these independent switches. This is a view from the top with the cover off. A little bit closer, you can see the uh, there's it's hard to see here, but there's inductors in here to eliminate uh, the high frequency interference from the other parts. And uh, we have operating modes. We got like a couple of minutes here. Yeah, we're real close to the end, so I won't go through it all. Basically, you know, voice contacts will be using the same frequencies that we've been using. Packet operation will be pretty much the same, except that with two of these systems up there, eventually we'll be able to be running packet in one module and uh, maybe a crossband repeater in another. We'll have a much more radioactive space station. Crossband repeater is the big thing. And, uh, we're looking forward to seeing how that looks. Okay, well, the summary is that uh, we're going to have a much more robust station and we think it'll be more reliable because we've been very, very careful in designing this thing, just like any other spacecraft system. Uh, I know it's a, it's just ham radio, but to us it's, it's very important and we're, we put all the reliability that we can into it. I think that's it. We've got time for some questions. Any questions? Well,
we've saturated them with answers already. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see when is this going to fly? Uh, we're hoping this coming uh, maybe in summer or, or late spring. We're, that's an optimistic view, believe me. But uh, we're, we're going to be taking it in for EMI testing uh, right after the first of the year. So uh, once we get through that, then it's just a matter of producing them and testing them to make sure they're good shipment. Yeah, the big issue will be getting all the testing done and getting it scheduled through NASA. We can't just say we're ready to go and they'll meet with us the next day. We oh, just have to wait a bit. They have to put everything aside for us, right? Yep. Yeah. What well, is this? Is the other seven that are going to be up there? Will the other uh, seven that are going to up there? It's in yes. Russian well, it's up to the Russians. Uh, they've been having little problems, and so. That's why we're pushing to get, our, get the new one up as soon as possible. All right. Thank you. What uh, happens to all the old hardware that's up there now that's going to be replaced? Is it going to be just brought back and decommissioned and brought it'll, back to the museum? It'll probably be put in the trash. How about auctioneers? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. It costs more money to bring it down. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, so our next presentation is um, Bob Davis, KF4KSS, on the uh, multi-voltage power supply mechanical design. Good afternoon. How's the volume? Yeah. Okay. Great. So, uh, boy, young people prepared, so they had words on their slides. I have some pictures, and I just talked to the pictures. <laughs> so, uh, this is the MVPS, and uh, I'm just going to give you an overview of the outside and the inside. Uh, so, on the outside, this is the um, down here. Look at that. This is the input side, so here's uh, uh, one, 120 in, 120 pass through, 28 in, 28 pass through. On top of is the, uh, the D710. Um, actually, that is an optional component of it. If I understand correctly, it actually launches without that, and then it's a Velcro in place uh, in ISS. Uh, this funny looking thing is actually one of the two fans, because we didn't have enough room inside for both fans. So we had to push one fan outside. Uh, uh, this is one of the two sides that has um, fins, because uh, part of the problem is, is airflow. Um, let's see here, I'll go to the next slide. Sweet, here's a, a bank of four multi-voltage out. And then this is the actual front of the radio. The, uh, I think the display will go uh, out to the front. Uh, some handles. Uh, there are uh, like rubber pads under the feet. Uh, and then this thing just gets Velcro in place on the plate. Sorry, we're we making up time right now. Uh, so, uh, with the lid removed, um, that means uh, removing the, or I shouldn't say having to remove it, but this is something that the astronauts never do. This requires a tool. This is not something they ever open. But to show you what it looks like on the inside, it is very tight. Um, we have in here, I think, something like uh, 10 boards. So in general, again, this is the, um, those for the output. So the board that we can see here is actually the input. Then in the middle, we're basically doing all the converting. And then everything comes out here, you can see that for every connector you have switches to activate the different voltages. 
And um, on this side here, we we have the uh, switches for uh, converters. And then uh, if I rotate it around, this is now the uh, the input, and we're actually looking at the the output board here. And on this side, you have uh, uh, four USB. And uh, you know some of the things that that come up are. How are we treating all these corners? Everything was just so tight. Uh, so there's a lot of this, uh, you know, how, how big of a board can it be? Well, it has to be L-shaped, <laughs> you know, to fit it into this little crevice over here. Uh, so uh, there are uh, obviously requirements from NASA. Uh, what I always find interesting is the difference between requirements to go in ISS versus things like our spacecraft. So uh, one of the, my favorite topics, off-gassing versus out-gassing. Um, those are two separate things, but they're very closely related. So off-gassing is uh, sort of the new car smell. Out-gassing is what, happen, what uh, um, contaminates other things in a vacuum. So it's very interesting that for satellites, we're, we're all obsessed about out-gassing. What's going to end up? Um, outgassing in a way that would uh, cause a, a, a camera lens to fog. But then for the off-gassing, we're like, okay, well, we're sealed in this container. What's going to smell like a new car? <laughs> um, so then some of the other interesting things. Uh, uh, sp spacing for fingers. Uh, if I can just go back one slide, we'll see if that works. <laughs> uh, you have barrel connectors. How tightly can they be before you end up scraping your knuckles trying to put it on? Uh, you know, things like this. Uh, bump guard for switches. And the funny thing is, you know, when you're in a room full of four walls uh, and you're floating around, you know, you could almost call that a toe guard <laughs> because your feet are, you know, you're, you're, you're moving around like this, there's equipment everywhere. Uh, labeling is another interesting thing. Uh, this is the only side where actually I'm showing some labeling, I think. Uh, but you know, all of that has to get reviewed and then the re revisions for that. What does it look like? I don't know, we'll, we'll uh, uh, finalize that later. Uh, no sharp edges. So not only are you talking about safety of, of individuals, you, know, you, uh, you don't want to do anything that would uh, uh, nick someone, you know, a sharp burr because it's a machine component. But now you have a little problem of, well, maybe they're passing by with a spacesuit or some other fabric pouch. Uh, you know, what happens if we come along and, and scrape it? You know, so it's interesting all these things that, that come up. Uh, the other huge difference uh, from spacecraft, no vibration test. So this is actually soft packed uh, into the, uh, the launch vehicle. And we don't have a bolt pattern to the launch vehicle. So normally, like when we have a satellite, there's going to be like four or some other small number, three or four, uh, hard, large screws, right? That's where you bolt it down and then you shake it, make sure it's going to work well. Here, we don't have a bolt pattern. We have four handles and we have, uh, uh, you know, rubber feet, you know. So uh, it's, it's kind of funny. So we're soft so So that's one of the other uh, major differences. So. Um, golly, that was like a minute of slide. <laughs> um, evolution of the enclosure. So this was, you know, it, it, when you're first formulating this, right, you, you pick up the first concept and you start to figure out what the problems are, right? So the very first thing that we started with was, let's make this out of a, a, a chunk of aluminum, right? And then it takes about 30 days for you to figure out, oh, uh, the, the problem is uh, airflow. Uh, we'd rather have someone already have machined uh, uh, fins, right? So let's go over to an enclosure that has fins. So we ended up then going into another enclosure and uh, start populating in connectors, and then you start looking at the requirements, you're like, oh, the connectors have to be spaced out farther, right? So then you go to yet another. Uh, 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 so this is actually the uh, enclosure that we settled on. This is an enclosure that we actually imported from Japan. Uh, then we go off and, and uh, customize it. 
at handles. Uh, this shows some of the early days when we were looking at having a J5. So as we go through this iteration of what the, what the ins and outs are, uh, started out by having a, a, a pair of brackets to hold the uh, D710 as if you, you had a, a mobile mount in your car. Uh, and we sort of evolve. It's like, okay, well, that requires a fast. <laughs> Uh, are we going to require the astronauts to show up in a screwdriver? Uh, no. Okay, well, let's, let's hold it on with Velcro. <laughs> so they, these are the kind of uh, evolution things that you go through this. Of, of how you do this better than your first day. And so, uh, let's see, that was the course of uh, May, June, July, August. So in about three months, we sort of settled on, on these kind of So here's the only good shot I'm showing you is one of the, the sides. This is the uh, cons in side. So we have the 120 in and its pass through, and then the 28 uh, uh, in and its pass through. And then this is the rear of the D710. So it has its own, uh, its own fan right here. Uh, these are bars. So the D710 settles in place. And you just put a big velcro strap over the whole thing, no screws. And then this is the uh, uh, the housing for the one of the two fans that just didn't fit inside. So for the overall size of this, uh, I guess we were debating. Here I am, not showing off my own drawing of how big it is, but it's something like three and a half by ten by eleven. Yeah, like twelve and a half by eleven. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so it's actually very small, and sometimes it's it's hard to remember that when I have a CAD model, I can zoom in all I want. Uh, I can count threads on screws and then I have to zoom out and I'm like, oh wait a minute, it's only this big. <laughs> so again, this is actually showing, uh, I think it's 10 circuit boards? Nine. Nine circuit boards? So what looks like, um, you know, you're like, oh, plenty of room, and then you start looking at the, the details and like this this gap here, and there's there's components that are on top of another board. You know, we're, we're end up counting uh, gaps that are only the, the width of some of these surface mounts. You know, so it's very tight. And no electrolytics. No and no electrolytics. So the, uh, the one thing that we did accomplish was leaving this one little spot that so we can have all these grounds come in. Other than that, every interior surface is a circuit board. Look at that. <laughs> Last slide. Um, so um, we have fabricated a prototype in nine, ten units. Um, and you know a lot of the work that I did that I'm showing here, this happened almost a year ago, and I have to super thank Lou and Ed uh, because when I basically disappeared, these poor guys had to just sort of step up and say, okay, so Bob has this drawing of how it's machined. Now, how do we put it together? So I have to thank them. But listen, if there are anyone that is interested, please volunteer, come forward. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I gave that. With there's also the, the way to volunteer through Eros, but uh, volunteer at uh, amsite.org if you're interested. Um, I'll go ahead and take questions. Yes. I have a uh, few questions. Yes. One, are uh, tackling capacitors allowed? And uh, two, no. what uh, modeling program did you use? Uh, is that SolidWorks or what kind of stuff? So the, the first question was appropriately not asked to the mechanical guy, canceling capacitors, and you answered no. Uh, the second question is what kind of software am I using? Uh, this is uh, Autodesk Inventor. Uh, primarily we're using this because we just sort of already had a relationship with them dating back to the 90s when we were developing AO40. Um, so that package is still alive. We, uh, we're using the same package for Fox, uh, 
we're, we're not bound to it, but we're thankful for the education discount that we have received. Next question. We have time for a few more, Bob. I know, I went very fast. <laughs> and they're wasting it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if there are no other questions, then uh, I'll pass it on to uh, whatever. Uh, next up is Ed Prune. And he's uh, going to be talking about the uh, Ares interoperable radio system multi voltage power supply thermal and noise. So take it away. my topic is thermal, uh, anything that draws current is going to generate some heat because nothing's 100% efficient. So we got to have at least 13 amps out of the 13.8 volt supply, at least 7 out of the 28, and then all the, uh, the USBs and the uh, slow scan TV powers. And the whole thing, as I said, has to operate off both 120 volts and 28 volts with no modifications or crew interventions. And then all the pass-throughs. So it has to do a lot of stuff. Everything has to be redundant. The cooling, sensors, controllers. You have to have solid state circuitry providing overcurrent, transient, and disconnect functions. Indi also, independent thermal overload protection in case everything else went to the dogs. And uh, of course, meet these uh, EMC and power quality requirements, which turn out to be quite, uh, quite interesting. Oh yeah, and then you've got to do the uh, Russian segment requirements too. You've seen this one. This is the, uh, the entire interoperable power supply system. This is a little bit about what's going on inside. And what with this, the main thing to see here is just there's all kinds of filters. There's limiters, there's current limiters. There's thermal switches all over the place. There's converters back and forth. There's a lot of stuff going on in here. The cooling system down here has two, it, it has, it's redundant, so it has two fans. It also has two temperature sensors and two independent controllers. So either part of it can die and the rest of it will continue working. This thing was designed by Kerry Banky and I'm just kind of in awe of the uh, complexity of this thing and how much he did to design this. This was the original one that he built that was taken to Johnson Space Center and it was extensively tested and it passed quite well. A little bit about thermal. Uh, I asked the question early on, and I got sucked into this thing, Lou, thank you, uh, <laughs> about uh, how hot? Okay, and we got an answer from NASA, and they sent us a 500-page document on the thermal considerations. <laughs> the long and short of it was no external touch point temperature should exceed 45 degrees centigrade. So we set a goal of 41 degrees centigrade so we would have a margin of safety. One of the things that I found really interesting was that you know, heat is transferred by convection, conduction, and radiation. But in space, since you don't have gravity, hot air doesn't have anything to rise against. So when things get hot, the hot just stays there. It doesn't go anywhere. So you got to have fans to push air around to cool things. The, uh, I mentioned automatic fan control. Well, 
we not only have automatic control, separate controllers of each of the temperature of each fan, but there's cross control. So in case one of the multiple sensors is hotter than the other, it controls all the fans to respond to the hottest. So in case that keeps keeps us from having little hot spots that aren't corrected. Well, what do you have to, uh, you saw there's not much space left in this thing. It's got five DC to DC converter modules. Bottom line is, this thing, oops, wrong, wrong one. The bottom line is, even at 85% efficiency, this little box has to dissipate 80 watts of heat uh, when it's running at full load. And everything gets hotter in space. Well, you can't just test things at 80%, so we did testing also at 125% of what we ever think the maximum capability of this thing would be. So and that's dissipating 100 watts through this small box. How do you manage cooling? There were a number of things uh, bandied about, about how you circulate air through this thing, how you have a redundant system, including things like uh, Two fans with two fans with flapper valves on the bottom. Nah, you know, too much mechanical complexity. The final thing we ended up with for, for cooling was having two fans, but they were in series. NASA doesn't like fans in series, except we were not relying on the two fans for increased airflow. We were simply relying on them for redundancy. If one fails, the other one keeps working. Now, if you remember seeing the pictures, Bob's pictures of these things, there's only two heat sinks on this box. There's one on each side. And there are five DC to DC converters. And these things are about three and a half inches long and about an inch and five eighths wide. Well, there isn't enough physical space on the heat sinks to mount all five converters, and yet they all generate heat. So what we ended up doing, after some bunch of head scratching, was mounting two of the uh, DC to DC converters on one heat sink and having the two of them mounted on a large copper bracket. Copper's being, of course, a very good heat transfer medium. So, and we could get away with this because we know that on these particular modules, which are the ones that supply the D710, it does not have a 100% duty cycle. So, you know it's going to operate you know, for some period of time and then it will be off. All this stuff has thermal inertia. Uh, I did a fair amount of mathematical analysis, <laughs> messing around with this stuff initially, and it looked like, yes, we could get away with this sort of thing. But, you know, anytime you think about, well, yes, is this going to work? We probably ought to try it. So I put together a test device and took an actual case and machined the thing to look like all Bob's drawings were as close as I could, and then simulated the uh, heat sources in this thing, which are the five DC to DC converters, with aluminum plates of the same footprint, and I put power resistors, these load mount resistors, on each one, and controlled each resistor with a separate power supply, so we could duplicate the amount of heat generated in all kinds of conditions. And then monitor uh, air on the outside, air temperatures, case temperatures, internal temperatures, more temperatures than you can shake the stick at. The first set of test methods was finding out what it would really do. So instead of reading all this, what these essentially were was running at fixed loads and fixed fan speeds. And then doing this through a whole range and continuously increasing the loads or decreasing the fan speeds and find out what happens. The net result was we had two, we had more fan than we really needed. So this set of uh, tests resulted in improved fan sizing. Also ran tests with each fan disabled, either mechanically locked or freewheeling. Trying to think of you know, how many different things can happen on this thing. Results were pretty good. But I had mentioned that there is a uh, not 100% duty cycle on the radio. Kenwood has really figured out what the duty cycles are that they expect on this radio, and this is what they tested their radios to. There are the three modes of operation, the 25-watt voice mode, 
And this is essentially one minute full transmitting, one and a half minutes on uh, squelch open, one transmitting, this whole sequence 20 times, and then a, uh, a down time. A 10 watt digipeter level, also a different sequence, and a five watt repeater level, also a different sequence. Level two testing. Let's test this thing on what it's actually gonna see. Once we were comfortable that the fans could do the job. So we set up a test setup with automatic loading to this profile using an Arduino. Learned a lot about Arduino program. Automated data acquisition recording with a lab jack, uh, analog to digital converter, and a, uh, and a computer. So now once I get this thing started, I can start it up and kind of sit back and watch what happens. And uh, my wife is actually doesn't think these kind of things are too strange anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Just kind of went, oh, that's nice there. And it worked. This is the kind of data we got out. Uh, this is degree centigrade on the left. Remember our goal was 41 centigrade. The hottest thing that we saw there was about, uh, about 36, an average of about 36 degrees centigrade. So this side, like, yeah, this thing's working pretty good. And this is under the, the actual expected full loading condition in the worst case. But I had a little problem. These little fans are noisy as hell. Uh, there are, the noise requirements are very specific, both on continuous noise and on non-continuous noise in different segments of the noise band. The fans were just too noisy. This thing was would run in excess of 50 dB noise, and that's just too much. So, tried a whole bunch of different things. And the indirect, the one on the upper left, is uh, this is where the air comes in, just a baffle box to kind of try to disturb the uh, the sound wave. That didn't work. And then I put a baffle inside of the box to try that. You know, you know, dB or so, but really nothing. I work with a company called Soundcoat, which is, uh, specializes in sound damping methods. Uh, and they have uh, NASA approved material. And they were kind enough to send me a chunk of their, what turned out to be extremely expensive material. And, but it only took down like two dB, two or three dB. Well, the bottom line was, after some more head scratching, is we changed the fans. Uh, these are 40 millimeter square fans. These little fans were 40 millimeter square. They're the same ones used on the Kenwood. Uh, we changed the 60 millimeter fans. Well, these fans only run at about 3,000 RPM. These fans run at 12,000 RPM. It makes a big difference on the noise. This thing is so quiet that I had to do the testing, the noise testing at 5.30 in the morning with my air conditioner off. I live out in the country in rural Indiana. That's when there's no noise outside at all in the 30 dB range, which is almost undetectable. So it worked pretty good. So we're in good shape. Redundant fans, sensors, controllers, everything works. Fans are located within the enclosure. The airflow's in the top. Push the right button. The airflow's in the top here is distributed around inside the case and comes out through the fins on the side. If you notice, it looks like the fins on the side are blocked. Well, they're not blocked, but they're baffled. The air is actually routed through slots inside the case, into the fins, across the fins, and then out the top. You have to, direct, have to tell the air where it's gotta go to make this thing cool properly. And that worked pretty good. Except, Kerry discovered in his testing that there were a couple of diodes. You know, there's all kinds of routings, one diodes being one way valves inside of this thing. And there were a couple of steering diodes on the cons inboard that got really hot. Not hot enough to fry them, but just hot enough for what we were comfortable with. So he came up with another idea, a duct, which he made out of a piece of uh, plastic rain gutter. And, uh, but the problem with that is there's no space inside the case. So the fans wouldn't both fit inside the case. 
The solution, put one fan in the case. Put the other fan on top of the case. And then make a tower that's Velcroed in place over the top fan. And the air cleaner, which you have to have, is on top here. This fan, this thing has to be removable. Well, this, this worked doubly well because this tower is held to the top of the case. You just pull the thing off, clean the fan, stick it back on. So the whole thing worked out pretty good. Required no electrical changes, but still, they had, to they had to present this thing back to NASA to get their approval. And here, this is kind of a cross-section view showing one fan on top and one fan inside. Pretty good shape. What's next? Now we've got to build about 10 of these things. And I know you've heard the number of having to build a bunch of them. Well, this is where they go. This is a flight identical unit, which will be flogged again at uh, Johnson Space Center uh, to make sure everything passes. Then there will be two units that are set up for the US side, flight one and the backup. Two for the Russian side, and then training. One for at Johnson Space Center here, two for Russia, an engineering test unit that Lou will keep track of. Uh, you gotta have one on the ground that's just like one that's flying and software development power supply for uh, uh, Dave and uh, programming the radios. And that's where the thing is. It looks pretty good right now, and we're just getting ready to start building. Sir? Five minutes. Five minutes, okay. I'm done. Questions? 30 minutes, I guess. Heard you mentioned you have a, a filter on it for the air. How much dust do you have to be able to tolerate does that need to be cleaned every so often? Or look, and probably Lord, or, uh, Ken. Okay, it'll be on Ken. We, we all have a cleaning schedule, and they do that for everything up there. They have a schedule, and you know, like on the third Monday, the fourth month, or whatever, you know, you tell them when to do it, and they go by and do that. Fortunately, it's pretty easy to do with this towel on top. <laughs> we got an electrolytic or can actually have you filter the Ceramics, and there's a lot of inductors in there. If you look at some of the uh, uh, some of the drawings or some of the pictures of these big, big, big black ferrite things, lots of inductors. Lots of ceramics. Lots of what? Lots of ceramics. The yellow dots you see in there are ceramics. Yeah. First. So am I right that you are actually discharging all the heat up into the ambient air? Yes. And, yes. and so at what point do you have to do something different? I mean, is there a limit? There must be a limit of how much heat you can put out into the uh, air of the transmission. Kenneth, can you answer that? Kenneth Branson. Yes, there is a limit to how much heat we can actually dump into the space station. Closer to 600 watts, but we're not going to be anywhere near the environment. They can say, give us some free bubbles. Great. Any other questions? Thank you. Try to take a short break after Paul's presentation, so um, be aware of that. Um, Paul Spencer's next. He's going to talk about the digital voice on the amateur satellites and experiences with LO90. Institute of Technology in China uh, as part of the 
QD50 project, which was uh, intended to study the lower thermosphere. Uh, its science payload is an ion and neutral particle mass spectrometer. It was uh, deployed from the ISS on May 25, 2017, and uh, designated LO90 by AMSAT on June 20th of uh, 2017. Currently, or at least uh, when I wrote this presentation a few days ago, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the orbit has decayed down to 343 by 340 kilometers, uh, according to DK3WN's website. The uh, predicted decay date is February 13th of 2019. So if this presentation inspires you to try it out, uh, you better be quick about it. Uh, so the amateur radio payload, uh, the downlink is on uh, 77 meters, uh, has a 9600 BPS BPSK downlink. Uh, the power output is either 200 or, or 500 milliwatts. I believe it normally runs at 500 milliwatt level because it is a strong signal. Uh, the uplink is uh, 145.985 megahertz FF. Uh, 67 hertz CTSS tone for the uh, digital voice transponder. And uh, it has an open, uh, open uh, telecom. That's cool. sorry. Thanks, Lou. Uh, it has an open telecommand uh, uh, system uh, or an AX25 UI packet for any amateur radio operator can command the, trans, uh, the, the camera uh, uh, on board uh, just by sending it an AX25 packet and that's all documented how to construct that, that packet. So the 9600 BPS downlink accommodates telemetry, camera, and voice all on the same downlink stream. Uh, there's a 7-byte codec 2 frame encoding 40 milliseconds of the audio from the FM uplink uh, included in each 120-byte packet. And the remaining space, of course, is used for telemetry and, and camera data. Uh, so this is really a hybrid uh, satellite. It's regular analog FM voice up and then uh, codec 2 digital voice down. That's a camera image that was uh, taken by uh, W2RTV up in New Jersey on uh, October 30th. So you can see how, how that, uh, you can get decent shots out of it. It just comes down in regular JPEG data. So for uh, anybody who's not familiar with Codec 2, it's an open source speech codec designed for low bit rate digital voice communications. The available bit rates are between 700 and 3200 bits per second. Uh, LiveX at 1, 0, 90 uses the 1300 bit per second codec 2 uh, bit rate. Uh, most of the use of codec 2 currently is in the form of free DV on HF. And uh, free DV allows the use of digital voice using a standard HF single side band transceiver and similar setup to sound card digital modes. In fact, 700D version of free DV uh, can actually outperform single side band in poor conditions. So let's talk about operating through LO90. So the uplink is very simple. It just uh, requires only a standard FM transceiver. Uh, 5 watt HT is perfectly adequate for this. However, the downlink is the challenging aspect of the satellite. As I mentioned, it's a 9600 bit per second to BPSK downlink. Uh, the only decoders available are through GNU Radio, on, generally on Linux, or the only ones that have been made available. Uh, there's a live CD image that was prepared by uh, M6SIG in uh, the UK uh, with a Linux distribution with all the uh, necessary software installed that you can download and just run as a, a live CD on your, uh, on your computer. There's also uh, decoders from Harbin or uh, an improved decoder from EA4GPZ uh, that reduces the latency of the, of the uh, Codec 2 decoding. Uh, that can be installed on any existing Linux installation, although it does require a bit of Linux knowledge to get it configured properly. I spent about eight hours doing that, because I'm not great. <laughs> um, a $22, uh, $22 RTL SDR, SDR dongle uh, works just fine. Uh, I've used the Funky dongle, uh, as well as an AirSpy Mini, and both of those work great for it too. 
uh, and as I mentioned before, installing and using the decoders on an existing Linux system does require some upper level of, uh, of Linux experience. So now I have to get out of here. Or the embedded video didn't come through, so we got it up here. And this is just going to be a short clip of a couple of QSOs that I made uh, back in August here. Um, so, okay. Um, so this is this is the uh, uh, this is the screen from my uh, portable uh, system that I use. Uh, see the GQRX downlink here, and it's running through the uh, GNU radio decoder. So we'll just play that. Now I did use a relatively low. I, I'm using a relatively low spec system, and I was screencasting this. So anytime the audio decodes, it actually the screencast it actually flips out of it. Do we have audio here? It's muted. Oh, Thanks. <laughs> Receiving the, the digital 
I don't think so. Uh, tomorrow morning at 7, 11 a.m., if anybody's up uh, in front of the hotel, um, out in the parking lot in front of the hotel, uh, I will be doing a live demonstration. Anybody's welcome to uh, join me at that nice early hour and, uh, and uh, see it in operation live. I, I hope that uh, my live demo uh, goes better than starting this live stream today. <coughs> and uh, any questions? This is the uh, QSL card that Harvin has sent for, uh, uh, for regarding the telemetry. Yeah. Bill and I are going in stereo. Okay, okay so uh, GNU Radio runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Yeah, I, I don't. It's a pain. I agree with you. It's a pain. It doesn't run. What we need is good instructions. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm surprised by the point about Linux. We'll just run on a Raspberry Pi. Um, I, I suppose so. Yeah, I, I the problem so. should be solved. I don't, I mean, Raspberry Pi is $35. No, no, you're, you're, you're right. I mean, if, if somebody were to, the software should be able to be compiled and run on, on a Raspberry Pi. Is Raspberry Pi fast enough? Is my, my question. Yes, yes, it should be. Especially with free. But, I mean, we should have it available for all three platforms. What do these I agree. And, and, and again, part of the reason, you know, there probably has been more interest in developing that as this was deployed to the ISS and has a limited or a whole lifetime, so, you know. The other, the other comment is, uh, you know, Dave's done an, an amazing job with uh, Kodak too, but some of this is just too slow. It, it just, uh, that's his personal comment. I mean, I have, it, it, I have uh, used it on HF. I've had a few QSOs of 3, 3 dB, the 700T mode uh, on HF, and it, yeah, it doesn't sound great, but. <laughs> It does work. It does work well. Who was the other station? I'm sorry. Who was the other station besides you? Uh, that had worked through all the ninety. It's on the recording. Who was on the recording? Oh, the other station. That was uh, Scott King for KDR. Yeah, he was not understandable, and you were perfectly understandable. So pretty amazing. Yeah, they had, if I ran the clip longer, uh, N6 RFM would have come in, and he sounds even better. Well, one thing that uh, I don't think Scott was doing, but, but, but Bob and 6RFM was, uh, he was using, and I wasn't either, he was using Doppler correction on the uplink, which uh, helped the encoder out. So, I think we have one more question over here. Yeah, what was, yeah, what was your, uh, your setup in terms of uh, antennas and, and things like that? Yeah, so um, I expected this to run longer, I guess. <laughs> you got through it quickly. Uh, I was using. In, in, if you come out tomorrow morning, you'll see this, and it's also in the proceedings uh, article. Um, but uh, I was using an arrow, just an arrow antenna, uh, either a Fun Cube Dumbo, an AirSpy Mini, or an RTL SDR Dumbo. I've used all three of them. Uh, and I have it since I live in an apartment in Washington, D.C., so I have to do all my operating portable. And uh, I was using a, a connected desk, um, which is a, a laptop harness. There you go. Uh, you wear on your over your shoulders and everything. And I, I have um, a GP uh, GP Win. It's a, uh, a little handheld. Uh, and I apologize. I actually meant to bring it with me today uh, here. And I, it's back in my hotel room. But it's a little handheld PC. Um, and uh, I got it running Fedora and uh, installed the software on it. So that was was running there. But it's a real small thing. Just wearing it over my, uh, wearing it up, man portable and carrying the arrow. And, and I have a question about the uplink command to control the uh, camera. Is there a website that describes the protocol you have to use? And your slide said a thousand bit per second UI frame. Is that thousand or twelve hundred? No, it is one thousand. It's it's non-standard. Yes. Um, so the, you can. Um, there are way, I, I'm not a technical expert, so I really can't. Uh, I know there's a there's a uh, actual K4 KDR will make the frame. He'll uh, he can make the frame for it's just a, um, a it's the Harvard Institute of Technology uh, website or logs that one um, does have the information on constructing that frame. Okay. Anybody else? 
well, I think, uh, questions? Again, 7, 11 a.m. tomorrow morning is the pass, so come out a few minutes beforehand if, if you're interested, uh, just on the north side of the, uh, uh, of the, um, of the hotel uh, up front, and uh, be glad to demonstrate operating through it. I think I have a couple of pieces lined up, but we'll see early in the morning. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Um, even though we got off a little bit of a late start, we've uh, done well on time, so we can take us about a 15-minute uh, break here. Let's everybody try to be back about 3:10. Okay. Yeah. Three minutes.
Our next uh, presentation is by Jonathan Brandenburg. Um, he's the only guy I know that has more Raspberry Pis than the Raspberry Pi Foundation. <laughs> How many? I cannot count. 50, 60, somewhere in that count. Yeah, he's part of the market on Raspberry Pis. And this, and this is his presentation, the flexible, affordable, powerful digital transceiver for the Raspberry Pi. Thank you very much. Let me know if I overmodulate. I'm a professor. I tend to yell at my students, so uh, let me know how that goes. So the flexible, affordable, powerful digital transceiver, I tried to think of some more wonderful capabilities like helps you grow hair or lose weight, but I couldn't get that in that footprint. <coughs> and I need to stop moving, Donnie, because I'm on video. Oh. So uh, anyway, uh, well, the, the, the idea here really, I said the idea here really, there we go. Uh, we've got several esteemed organizations. We have AMSAT, we have the Libre Space Foundation, uh, University of Louisiana, Portland State University, Virginia Tech, I think, although I don't have their permission to use their name. What do all of these organizations have in common uh, that I'm talking about today? And uh, what they have is they have this AX5043, this magic chip from on semiconductor called the AX5043. And we're all using this in some way in a space-related fashion. We have AMSAT using it as part of the Golf T and Golf 1 IHUs, the AMSAT <coughs> simulator we're gonna see more about. I'm very excited. Libre Space Foundation's using it for their reference pocket cube satellite. Uh, University of Louisiana, I'm told, is using it for the beacon on their satellite and is using it for an educational platform, and Portland State University is using it as part of their IHU transceiver. So we're seeing a lot of use of this AX5043 from our semiconductor. And one of the things we might want to know is why? Well, this chip, and I just get to keep calling it the AX5043, is a digital transceiver chip. It is a single chip digital transceiver, very power efficient might be the way to say that. And it's got this, this capability that it can modulate and demodulate on the chip. It does all of the heavy lifting whenever you want to transmit or receive information. So for example, if I want to send a packet of data, they do the 25, for example, I just give it the, 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 the bytes, give it the data that I want to send, and the chip is then responsible for encapsulating it in the HDLC packet format, doing the error correction, adding those bits to the end of it, uh, doing the bit stuffing, all of that magic happens inside the chip. And uh, as an engineer wanting to transmit digital data, I just have to worry about the data getting to the chip and getting off of the chip. Uh, it does all the other magic for me, and, and that's just a, a, just a fantastic platform. Um, what else can this chip do? Well, what can this chip do? Uh, and I've presented here a list of all of the modulations that are built into this chip, all the modulations it can use. So, We've got AFSK and FSK and FM and PSK and I don't know, give me another SK, and it can do a lot of things built into the chip. And you just tell the chip, uh, give you a command, what kind of modulation you want, and it takes care of you know, the magic of modulating your data and transmitting it or receiving it and demodulating it. So uh, if, if all these look very attractive to me, then the next question might be, uh, if we're hams, what are the frequency bands and what kind of power can I get? And this chip ranges anywhere from uh, 27 megahertz up to over a gigahertz uh, in terms of both transmission and reception. I haven't personally checked to see if that's a hard upper limit, but it certainly could be. But in any event, going to a gigahertz uh, covers a lot of ham bands, VHF, UHF for sure, and even some, some uh, others in between. And as far as transmit power, um, the chip itself, uh, 16 dBm, which if I did my calculations right, is 40 milliwatts out of the chip. So the chip itself is not a, a weak transmitter, uh, but we could of course also put a, a power amplifier on it to punch up that power for longer uh, range transmissions. Um, it also is extremely sensitive. Um, in fact, it's so sensitive that in my attempts to test it in the lab, I'm unable to isolate it enough to keep it from receiving through my Faraday cage, my homemade Faraday cage consisting of a cooking tin uh, <laughs> built inside of it. Uh, but it's a very sensitive receiver as well. So it just seems perfect for so many space-based or experimental-based or ground-based applications that I wanted to mess with, 
experiment with, build with, uh, in the digital communication realm. So, if this chip is so wonderful and powerful, how do I get my hands on it and how do I actually do something useful with it? And uh, I did what I think many of you would have done and, and have the skills to do as well, which is I decided to go ahead and build an add-on board. And I decided to build this add-on board for the Raspberry Pi, and I'll move out into the light here. You know, the small single, uh, single board computer, credit card size computer, runs a variation of Linux. I decided to build an add-on board for that that contained this AX5043 chip. And the idea was that uh, I think it would make it more accessible, make it more available, make it easier to use, uh, make it possible for us to start using this wonderful digital transmission and reception capabilities in our own applications. And the Raspberry Pi was a perfect choice. It's affordable, $30, $35. Uh, somewhere in that, time, in that range. It's got the, the communication pathways that we need to communicate with this AX5043 chip, the, uh, the SPI bus, has I squared C and some other capabilities as well. And so I decided to start down this path of developing my own board, uh, and, and I call it my board. It, it's really a, a, a labor of love, this board, uh, and making it available for anybody else that might want to benefit from that. And so, um, I'm not a mechanical, electrical, or computer engineer. I'm a software engineer. I'm one of those software guys, uh, which meant hardware was all big and scary. So I got to start down that path and learn how to do hardware. And some of you are going to laugh at me, and that's OK. You're allowed to, right? Hardware is easy for some people. Software is easy for others. Um, but relatively few people seem to love both. Does anybody love both? Yeah, a few people love both. Weird. <coughs> we are. Um, so I actually learned uh, to use KiCad and lay out a schematic for the very first time um, to lay out this chip, which we see here in the center, and a Raspberry Pi connector and a temperature sensor. And I would love to claim that I came up with this all by myself, but I have to give credit where credit is due. There's a team of people, Matt, uh, Zach Metzinger here among, uh, among us today, uh, Bill Reed and uh, some others. Uh, Kind of, kind of made the first steps on this, and I got to stand on their shoulders. Uh, but the end result was that I was able, for the first time in my life, to actually devise a schematic for something that was not trivial, something that was interesting. And once I have a schematic, of course, then you want to develop boards. And KiCad is a, is a nice free open package for that. And I think many of us are familiar with the purple Oshpark boards, right? Uh, and so I ended up submitting uh, these uh, these layouts to, uh, to Oshpark and having, uh, having them develop a few of these prototypes for me. And it's not a particularly complex board. I mean, you've got the AX5043 chip there in the middle. You've got a filtering and matching network uh, out to an antenna port. Um, and then you have the Raspberry Pi connector up at the top. Uh, and it turns out this worked very, very well. Now, the challenge that you might run into, though, is once you have a schematic that yields you boards, you have a board in one hand, and you have a stack of surface mount components in your other hand, and that's when you don't sneeze and blow them all over their, uh, the room. <laughs> so you now have to assemble them. Um, and I, I tell Zach Metzinger this story, and I think it works out well. I have made two purchases at Amazon, which have been the best purchases of my life. One of those is this microscope. That, that Amscope microscope is just fantastic. I cannot imagine how I live without it. But most importantly, it allows me to use tweezers and put little surface mount components on that, uh, on that PCB that I got from Oshpar. And then the second best purchase I ever made was, um, I call it a reflow oven, but apparently there might be some translation challenges because it's also called an IC heater when you look at it on, on Amazon. So for you know a couple hundred dollars, I got a reflow oven that I could use to reliably build boards. So I went from knowing nothing about hardware to having a, a, a manufacturing lab in my home office, um, and uh, very successfully from that managed to build these boards. Now the question you might have is, well, so great, you're a software guy, you build hardware, uh, did it actually work? Uh, and I'm thrilled to say that it absolutely worked. Uh, we were able to build some, some sample applications um, based in part, again, upon some work that Zach Metzinger did with a little chat application uh, using GFSK. I further extended that so that I could actually send and receive APRS packets uh, using the AX25 uh, protocol. 
So this board actually proved its flexibility and capability, um, and I just loved it. Now, for those of you that are sticklers, by the way, let me point out, I, I recognize a little, little non-standard aspect of this. I am transmitting AFSK packets uh, in the UHF band. Uh, I understand that by typical standard, we're supposed to be using raw FSK at that band, but I really wanted AFSK because I wanted my AFSK to work. And my filter network was set to UHF on my board. So we'll talk more about filter networks, but I recognize that discrepancy as some of you are kind of holding back the tears or the complaints about that. But the end result was is that we were actually, uh, I was actually able to develop uh, some very powerful applications very quickly using a Raspberry Pi in this little board that I, that I assembled. Um, but did everything work? Did everything work? And the answer is, well, there were some challenges. There were some, some bumps in the road. Uh, one of the challenges is documentation. Um, the OnSemi AX5043 has a reference manual. And that reference manual does a really good job of describing each individual register on that chip and what that individual register does. But what it doesn't really do a good job of, of telling you is how to work with those registers together, how to combine those registers together for something useful and important. What they instead say is run our little code generator and do whatever it says. <laughs> There's even some registers on that chip, I said that it does a good job of documenting them, but there's even some registers on that chip that are undocumented registers. Documentation in the X5043 manual says, for this register, use whatever the software spits out. It literally says that. Um, and that was one of, the, one of the challenges. The other challenge that I had is that that code generator um, assumes that you're using an on-semiconductor processor, using one of their processors. Um, and it assumes that you're using interrupts as well. And if I wanted this to be more general and more broadly applicable, and I wanted this to be usable on the Raspberry Pi, then I had to recast that software and rewrite it so that it would work with the Raspberry Pi without interrupts and a more general processor. Uh, now, as a side note, there's a little licensing issue that I had to sidestep at the same time because you're not allowed to port that software that they generate. Um, so I couldn't take the software generated code and port it over to the Raspberry Pi. What I had to do instead is I had to learn. I had to read their software and learn how it worked, and then rewrite the software. At least that's how I uh, approached it in, in a manner of speaking. So there were some challenges there. Uh, we've also had a third challenge pop up recently, which has to do with chip availability. The AX5043 has a temporary supply chain problem. Uh, don't panic, you'll see that it's discontinued on, on Mallet or DigiKey, but it's only a certain real size and footprint of uh, uh, real that's been discontinued. They're in the process of moving to a new uh, manufacturing facility, and, uh, and they're, 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 they're trying to get the supply chain refilled, but in the meantime, they're showing a 15-week uh, delay in terms of getting these chips. Um, I, on the other hand, and a few others, I think, in this world, uh, saw that coming and bought a hundred or two and shoved them in my closet somewhere just in case I needed them. So we do have some chips out there. They're a little short supply, but I hope that that particular challenge resolves itself shortly. Um, the other question that we might have for, uh, for this is, uh, what about ham frequencies, right? Does this chip work well in ham frequencies? Uh, and it turns out that the data sheet for this AX5043 chip has some reference designs, has some reference components to work in a variety of, of interesting bands. Um, 169 is kind of near ham. 433 and 470 are, are interesting to us, but none of them really clearly specify the range of these matching networks and how they would match to the ham bands. So this uh, turned into uh, yet another opportunity to learn something that I knew nothing about. Uh, which is circuit simulation, uh, which was really cool, but I didn't know much about it at the time, so my journey continues. Uh, I ended up learning a, a circuit simulator called Kooks. Uh, I believe uh, some of you may be familiar with it. Um, and, and Kooks is a circuit simulation package that I use to, to assemble those matching networks that were in the reference documentation and then simulate the response of those networks across a variety of frequencies. And from this, I was able to confirm that the, uh, the, the broad response of each of those filtering networks, even though it was, say, designated for 169 uh, megahertz, worked very well across 144, 148 in, in the bands that we're, that we're interested in. And similarly, the UHF band 
I also found that it was able to have offer me a very broad response. And in fact, I think that's what we're looking at here is the UHF simulation. And so from that, I gained a level of comfort that those networks that were in the reference documentation would work uh, in hand bands for both experimentation and, and frankly, flight, uh, if we need to fly these in space, which I think we might. Um, here's a nice network, yada, yada, yada. Three pictures. Uh, what's next on this board? Well, number one, let's talk about where this board is at today. Uh, I, uh, I have built a few of these boards and distributed them uh, at Hamvention for some folks, offered some to a, to a presentation we'll see tomorrow on CubeSat simulator for AMSAT. AMSAT's uh, offered a few boards for sale. I don't know where they went, but on the, on the store, I, I think. Um, but I also want to uh, extend the capabilities of this board. I want to expand it. I want to add a power amplifier to it. Uh, and I'm probably going to add the same power amplifier that we're looking at using on the Golf T. And then I also want to add a, a GPS module to it to make it sort of a self-contained uh, geolocation beacon, maybe for uh, balloons or, or uh, other high altitude experiments. So I wanted to take this basic Raspberry Pi board and I wanted to add to it. And in fact, I have started to do that. And this particular schematic is now a much more complex schematic uh, that I've managed to, to pull together. Some of this, again, uh, Zach Metzinger and some other teams with the Golf Project is familiar with the uh, power amplifier. But what is new and unique to me is this addition of the GPS module in here as well. So we're starting to get more and more complex capabilities. Um, and then I, of course, had sent to Oshkark. And now this board looks a whole lot more interesting. There's a lot less blank purple space on this board. Uh, and a whole lot more populated components. And uh, I'd like to have these to show you, uh, but they arrived one hour after I left my home yesterday. <laughs> so I don't have any of those to show you today, uh, but I'd like to. Uh, so I guess the, the, the point is in summary, what, what is this? This is a, a, a add-on board for the Raspberry Pi. It's a digital transceiver board with sample software that allows us to experiment and work with digital technologies. So it's a very accessible, uh, available format for us to start working with uh, these, digital, these digital modes. So for example, when Golf T launches and our IHU is flying, it's going to be transmitting telemetry down, maybe taking commands up. Uh, this particular board could be a very fine kernel for a ground station, for example, either to receive the telemetry uh, or if you're authorized to transmit commands back up to the satellite. So it's a, it's a fantastic little board, I think, that, that just makes it easier to work with this chip and work with this technology. Um, if you want one, uh, this is not something I'm going to retire on. This is not my, my, my fortune coming. This is something I want to give back to our community. I do have the, the, uh, uh, the files, the, the schematics, the PCB layouts, public domain. I do have a software public domain, uh, or I guess it's actually technically a GPL <coughs> license. Uh, AMSAT store did acquire some from me uh, as, as a fundraiser for the AMSAT organization, but I don't know where those went and if they've already sold. Um, but I'm also looking at opportunities to start making these in a larger quantity by talking with a, a sister technology organization, Tapper, about manufacturing these boards in some volume so that we can, uh, we can get these out of the hands of, of schools and, and experimenters that want them. You can, of course, build your own if you're so inclined, but if you want to build one uh, pre-built, we're certainly working on that path. Um, just as from our cost standpoint, we're always thinking dollars. Um, this is the scary side of the slide. This is the scary side of the slide where the, each board was about $19 for just a PCB. Components weren't bad, but the assembly was $52 for the assembled board. Uh, that seems kind of high, so um, that's part of the reason I hand assembled them. I did do some research in some relatively low quantities in the $100 to $200 range. We can start getting those prices down into the $20 range, which I think is a lot more achievable, especially if we want to start making these as part of kits uh, or otherwise get them out of the industry. So that was my rapid fire presentation on this Raspberry Pi board, its capabilities, where it's at today. Uh, do we have time for questions? <coughs> we have time for questions. We have two questions all or three questions all <coughs> I'm moving around. No. Yes. So in your in your second version, you added a GPS, um, and that explains the second SMA. What was the third SMA? Uh, the third SMA. It's a great question. Thank you for asking that. The AX5043 has two um, RF outputs, so to speak. 
Uh, one of them is a balanced uh, output, which went to the, one of the SMAs. The other is a single ended output that went to the other SMA. It's a single ended output that goes through the power amplifier. So one of them is the output through a power amplifier. The other is a balanced input and output that goes into the chip. Thank you for the question. And uh, I had a question, but uh, it was a slide you skipped over. Oh, no. Well, ask it anyway. Maybe I can cover uh, the it. The power drain when the trans AX 5043 transmits, uh, what's the average current drain on the chip? I'm sorry. I don't recall it off the top of my head. That's why I had to the slide that I skipped about over. Mils. But I'll be glad to answer that. It's about 80 mils. About 80 mils at full, uh, at full transmit power? Thank you for answering the question. Uh, you gave a talk in uh, Albuquerque, right? I gave a, 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 a less polished version, and I consider this polished. But no. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I thought. Uh, how much document? I, I've been over this since you mentioned it in Albuquerque, and I don't see a lot of hard documentation on their error interface. I mean, there are little bits and pieces about CRCs and photo volume and stuff like that. But you said this device might be end of life. Um, so I don't want to scare you by saying end of life. What I want to say is the one of the manufacturing plants, as I understand it, has decided to cease production. They're moving the production to another plant with a different real size, and they have more information on that, but that's what I believe I heard. Well, unless there's a fully defined error interface, how are you going to be compatible with this you know, quote-unquote standard and you can't get the chip? I don't like the price for a chip. Yeah, part of the answer to that, though, is that <coughs> the error interface is defined by you when you set the register. So the chip itself is a general Not flexible. really. I mean, they talk about FEC, but they don't talk about decoding. You know, it, it, it's, it's not completely defined. Yeah, there's multiple. I'm not happy with the documentation. There's multiple versions of FEC. There's multiple versions of the package. Yeah, they don't say what they are. Um, they, the answer is they don't say what they are, but it's in their code. So one of the challenges that I'm not super fond of is that we depend upon the code as documentation. Right? We send that for documentation for documentation. So there are definitely some challenges with their documentation, uh, but I found that those types of questions of the FEC and the, 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 the bit packing and stuffing is best described by the code. Uh, there's only a few truly undocumented things uh, and a couple of those magic registers, uh, and that does bother me, I admit. But we're finding uh, a lot of good uses for this chip, and uh, I've put up with that so far. Maybe not a satisfactory answer, but it's what I got for you. Any other questions, Jim? One, one more? One more. Sorry. So for all guys like me that are Linux challenged, um, I've done a little bit with the with the Transberry. It's a great system, but for those of us that are that are Linux challenged, will there be a software package available uh, from you or from someone that we can just load and run? Yeah, that's a great question. So. Um, as you say, if we're Linux challenge, the board that I built is made for the Raspberry Pi, which means it's made for the, uh, the, the Raspbian distribution of Linux, so to speak. Which is what I um, the, there's two ways to answer your question. The first is the chip itself and the board that I'm making is not necessarily tied to Linux itself. So it's certainly conceivable that a version of this could be made that would somehow work with the Windows system. But a, but a better answer might be um, that uh, we just have, a, have an image that goes on an SD card you plug it into the Raspberry Pi and it magically boots up into the right software with the right screen and you never know that you're working on Linux. That might be one of the possible answers there. That's, that's one of the, the issues that I've had with it is that, you know, if, you, if, if you're able to work with the Raspberry Pi and I am at a very low level, uh, if it's simple, I can work with it. But I think a lot of humans are in the situation they recognize the value of it. But it really is a long learning curve to get to the point that you some implementations yeah, and I, uh, I don't have any people to hear that, so I'll just try to try to close that off. And the idea is that some of us want to tinker with this technology, and some of us want to use this technology in a good effect. We need to be able to support both, and I agree with that. Thank you all very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, John. Doppler correction and tracking in commercial NGSO systems. Brennan Price.
Thank you, and uh, thanks everyone uh, for having me here. I, uh, by, by way of background, I uh, am uh, a senior principal engineer in regulatory affairs at Ecostar uh, Corporation right now. Uh, what that means is essentially I'm a lawyer who knows the significance of three decimals. Uh, and you can do a lot of things in the regulatory world. If you have legal education and know the significance of three decimals. Uh, this talk will not be as technical as uh, several here, uh, particularly not as uh, uh, very much off the top of the finish. Uh, this is more of a high level assessment of how uh, some things that we do in the amateur context are addressed in commercial systems, uh, as well as how these approaches in commercial systems that are being developed uh, might be utilized in the amateur sphere um, in the future. Uh, it's going to be more of a thought exercise and an engineering exercise. Uh, I hope you'll learn something new. Some of this may be old hat to some of you. Uh, some of it uh, may be, um, could be improved in many respects. So I uh, appreciate your indulgence uh, with uh, the presentation as we go forward. So uh, what is Echostar and what is Hughes? Echostar is a uh, satellite uh, operator. Uh, there are two divisions, Echostar Satellite Services and Hughes Network Systems. Uh, Echostar Satellite Services uh, is focused on operating uh, commercial uh, satellites in the geostationary orbit, uh, as well as um, putting data and programming through them. Uh, we carry the programming of DISH network, uh, distributed uh, direct to home. Uh, DISH is actually uh, commonly, uh, has a common majority shareholder, uh, Charlie Irvin, so uh, there's a fairly close relationship between those two companies. Hughes Network Systems has been around much longer than Echostar. It was um, uh, purchased by Echostar around 2012. Uh, Hughes is the largest uh, geostationary satellite uh, broadband internet services uh, provider in the country uh, with uh, approximately uh, 1.2 million uh, customers. So Hughes is uh, a GSO company, but it does have some interest in uh, NGSO technologies as well. Okay. The wrong button there. Uh, and when you compare the pros and cons of the various types of uh, satellite orbits, uh, you know, there are some advantages to having a geostationary satellite with a fixed position in the sky uh, versus uh, an NGSO, which might have more spacecraft but have things that you have to deal with. So satellites that stay geostationary orbit are very high altitude. They stay in the same place relative to any position on the Earth, more or less within uh, error tolerance. Um, the orbit is also high up, so the advantages are that the footprint is very large. Uh, there's no need to correct for Doppler because there is no relative movement between the, um, the satellite and whatever location on the Earth. And there's no need to track. You point the antenna, you forget it. Uh, everybody has seen the parabolic uh, satellite antennas that seem to be uh, ubiquitous used for various reasons, whether to receive broadcast uh, television or to um, communicate data back and forth. Um, it's a well-known model. But the satellite can only serve roughly one-third of the Earth. Uh, you, you, if you want to get global coverage you would, from the GSOR, you would need to launch at least three spacecraft in order to uh, take care of all the longitudes, and that doesn't count polar regions either. Uh, launch and maneuvering are very costly, and uh, there's inherent latency. You can't beat physics. I guess you can't beat physics either, but um, this is uh, need to prove a little bit uh, more closely, I suppose. But um, the speed of light uh, is such that uh, a return trip from uh, the Earth to the satellite to um, the gateway uh, means that you lose about uh, 500 milliseconds. Uh, during that trip, and there's nothing you can do about that. It's reasonably tolerable if you're not using a latency-sensitive application, uh, but if you're playing Call of Duty, uh, you, you can 
sustain a lot of damage in that uh, <coughs> in that half second that it takes to make the round trip. So uh, those are that's an assessment of GSO systems. Now non-geostationary systems are moving at any time relative to the position on Earth. We're familiar with this model because that describes just about the entire amateur fleet, uh, with the exception of um, SailSat 2, uh, which is slated for launch imminently, uh, and uh, the intended, uh, one of the early Oscars, I think it was Oscar 4, was intended to be a uh, GSO, never made it to the intended order. So we are very familiar with this model. This is us. So some advantages of this and why it's uh, useful for us is that a single satellite can be used throughout the universe of all possible footprints that you can that, that uh, you can think of. Uh, a, a LEO satellite in polar orbit uh, is an asset that can be shared by users around the world. You, you'll only get four to six passes per day, uh, and you have to time your operation. But if you have a, an asset that is being contributed to by people around the world. Uh, this is a way that, that asset can be enjoyed by people around the world. Uh, latency is minimized in low Earth and minimum Earth, medium Earth orbits because you don't have to go as far as satellite the uh, physics uh, work. Now it still is a factor of high Earth orbit. Uh, it's uh, you know, high elliptical orbits uh, do approach at um, uh, at apogee. Um, they approach at apogee. The, uh, altitudes that are similar to uh, what is the to the geostationary orbit um, altitude. So it uh, doesn't eliminate latency, but for at least LEOs and MEOs, and which are going to be uh, the primary focus of a lot of the uh, of commercial GSO applications, this is um, an advantage. And finally, it's less costly to launch and maneuver a single NGSO satellite into its intended orbit. Now, you multiply that by 4,000 satellites as uh, OneWeb or SpaceX or uh, a few other operators uh, would like to. Uh, that does add up. Uh, but uh, at least if you're dealing with a small network, you don't have to have as much power to uh, get it where it uh, needs to be. But and we're all familiar with this. Users of an NGSO system or an NGSO satellite have to track the satellite, it's moving across the sky, and users have to correct for Doppler shift as the uh, transmitter uh, moves toward the user and then away from the user. So, for the purpose, as I said earlier, for the purposes of having a scarce asset being used by people around the world, it makes sense uh, for something to be in uh, an NGSO orbit, uh, because it allows uh, a greater a greater portion of the Earth to use the asset uh, for uh, at least some period of time. And for radio amateurs, dealing with Doppler tracking is not really a big deal. Uh, one of the reasons why I chose to give this talk is because earlier this year I became active on the amateur satellites, so it largely FM only uh, at this point, uh, the uh, Fox Fleet and uh, SO50. I'm working on getting on the linear transponders and uh, the digital satellites as well. Um, and it is not unusual for us to run and dodge obstacles in order to track a satellite off the sky. What I do most of the things, I go out back, my HP, my arrow antenna, and uh, get straight stairs from my neighbors as A92 rises. I talk, click, 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 talk, click, 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 talk, and so forth. Um, so that works, uh, and it has a pedagogical value. It teaches us, as people who are interested in radio techniques, solar with uh, a personal aim to learn uh, such techniques um, and adjusting those frequencies and pointing the antenna at different points in the sky is a really effective technique to learn about Doppler and tracking. Uh, for commercial GSO applications, the amateur approach won't work. And granted, the, the point and click your transceiver is not the only way to do things. There are obviously computer-aided uh, tuning uh, techniques 
Uh, we'll talk about the possible applicability of that to uh, commercial situations um, soon. Uh, but what won't work is uh, mechanical tracking or manual tracking. Imagine that you want to watch Orange in the new Bla is the New Black on Netflix. Okay, click, 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 click. No, you, you want to put Netflix on your computer and watch the screen and forget it. So broadcast consumers want lower latency, but they won't want to chase AO92. Um, and there's a problem with the cat uh, antennas that mechanically move. Uh, that movement has to or increases the uh, power budget and wear and tear on the user equipment. Uh, nevertheless, tracking is still necessary, so we want a way to track things without uh, having, uh, without incurring the difficulties of uh, mechanical movement. Uh, the egg beater antenna model, uh, with, uh, which essentially focuses um, uh, energy up in a relatively non-directed fashion, uh, works well in the amateur context when you're above a certain elevation angle. But it um, won't cut it for commercial aspect uh, uh, constellations because there has to be beam shaping. Uh, as opposed to a single amateur satellite, the constellations that are involved here uh, will have uh, tens, if not hundreds. Uh, and in some uh, designs that are being contemplated, thousands of uh, satellites. Those are the plans. Obviously, these plans are in early stages. To the extent that they come to fruition is uh, anyone's guess, um, but you know we, we want a solution that permits beam shaping without um, a direction of energy to one particular satellite and not to another particular satellite uh, at any given time. So we've all observed signals sliding across a transponder if we've uh, been involved in the amateur satellite service. Um, and they occasionally conflict with each other. And these conflicts are annoying but educational in the amateur arena. Uh, in the commercial arena, it's not uh, quite uh, accept well, it, it, it's not acceptable to just deal with things. They have to be actively managed. Um, now, the one true rule, which we all know if we've read the excellent uh, publication uh, put out by AMSAP, again, started the Amateur Satellite Service, uh, is universally applicable. It is also critical in the commercial context. The solution is to uh, adjust the transmission so that each transmission arrives at the satellite at the same observed frequency on the satellite. Uh, so without using the one true rule, each channel on the transponder has to be wide enough to account for Doppler shift on each side. Uh, and that results in horrible inefficiency, particularly as you get up to the KA and KB bands. <coughs> uh, uh, we're all familiar with a shift of about 10 kilohertz uh, in each direction on the um, uh, U-band, 435 megahertz. Uh, on amateur satellites, if you move that up to KA band, uh, 29 gigahertz, uh, or the uh, commercial B band at uh, 48 gigahertz, um, you know you, you put that in F0 in the uh, equation there, uh, and you're beginning to get a very significant, um, uh, significant correction on either side. So we have to find a way to comply with one true rule. And the way that uh, we uh, do it on the FM sats, if you're pointing and turning your transmitter, is uh, essentially trying the best you can, or you adopt some type of computerized, uh, a computer-aided tuning. Um, the amateur approach to computer-aided tuning uh, relies on frequently updated and accurate uh, Keplerian elements. And that's based on a relatively small number of satellites. That's manageable for a fleet our size. Uh, it becomes considerably less manageable on constellations that may have uh, satellites that are adjusting orbits frequently. Um, you know, we all know that we have to update our caps. Uh, somebody trying to stream on Netflix might not uh, you know, the number of caps that are available here increase in complexity. So, is there another way? Well, sorry here. I 
promise I know how to use this. Okay. Well, the solution that has been uh, utilized by um, uh, previous generation NGSO systems uh, you for considerably more narrowband applications, and I'm thinking uh, uh, Iridium and uh, GlobalStar, has uh, been essentially relying on a control channel. And the control channel not only uh, assigns uh, spectra resources to each particular uh, user terminal, uh, it is also transmitting at a standard known frequency. And each user terminal determines what that frequency is, or determines the observed frequency, it, it, it can find the control channel across a particular range, uh, and it compares it to what uh, frequency it should be, and from that they can uh, determine the offset at any given time at um, the download band, uh, and can then quickly calculate the corresponding adjustment that needs to be uh, made on uh, the uplink band. Uh, so, uh, you know, the velocity at relative velocity between the Earth station and the space station at any given time is uh, determined uh, in uh, that way. Uh, large constellations offer another way to minimize Doppler. Uh, in practice, for reasons that we'll talk about in future uh, slides, uh, in the commercial context, you're only going to be communicating with satellites at relatively high elevation angles. Uh, we are uh, not trying to point to the horizon to complete a circuit uh, with phenomenal DX. Uh, we're looking for quality of service, and you're going to be looking for that quality at a, uh, uh, at a high angle. And there will be satellites at any given time, given the size of the constellations that are uh, envisioned, uh, that will be at high angles. So uh, that decreases the range of velocities observed. Um, you know from the amateur context that as you point to the horizon, on uh, the U-band, uh, you have a shift of roughly 9 to 10 kilohertz, and then it drops to zero overhead, and then another 9 to 10. Uh, if you're only looking at 30 degrees above, maybe you start at 7 or 6, and then end up at minus 7 or minus 6 on the uh, other side. Uh, so those are some te the te that's the technique for observing it in practice. It's um, and probably the technique which will be adopted by the systems that are under, under, develop, uh, under development. Uh, none of these are commercially widely available yet. Uh, they're still in the experimental phase. They need to be perfected. Uh, the actual solution may be different, but at least this is what is contemplated. Uh, tracking. Mechanical tracking, as mentioned earlier, uses energy. It wears out equipment. And the Eck meter solution doesn't permit the precision of beam forming and discrimination between one satellite and the other, uh, which you're going to need. Um, fixed service, satellite service antenna performance standards have very sharp uh, attenuations uh, that are required for uh, your appearance avoidance, and that's true for both GSOs and uh, NGSOs. Uh, at the same time, you have to curtail tracking uh, near the horizon, uh, and there's a regulatory reason for this. A number of the bands that are under consideration for these systems, and indeed the bands that are being used for by GSO fixed satellite systems, are also likely to have terrestrial users in the same band. Uh, the FCC is uh, imminently uh, going to proceed with an auction uh, for, in many counties in the United States, uh, for what they call a microwave flexible use service, where uh, uh, the winners will be allowed to provide either terrestrial or satellite services uh, using their license. Um, as uh, each, each satellite earth station transmitting on that band uh, takes a little bit of a donut hole out of the usability of uh, the band for, for terrestrial uh, purposes, and uh, for that reason, the energy has to be uh, pointed up. So, because there is uh, this overlap between terrestrial and satellite, in order for the compatibility case to work, uh, the whole model presumes that for Earth stations that are transmitting as opposed to receiving, and to a similar extent on the receive uh, side as well, uh, the Earth stations can be pointed up, well up above the horizon, and the uh, terrestrial stations uh, will be, at least the base stations, 
will be pointing down the user equipment from the terrestrial side will be relatively low power. Uh, so that's a reason why the FNM and elevation angles during the pass are so high. In the NGSO context, you uh, are not going to have an amateur uh, situation such as the one where N1AIA uh, communicated with F4 DX bands, RA type of Jerome's call by SO50. Uh, SO50 had a uh, distance record set by these two gentlemen a couple of days ago. They were both actually boss working with AIA here in the um, uh, States and uh, Jerome F4 DXD in uh, Europe. So what's the solution? Well, it's not a new solution. It's essentially phased array antennas. Uh, and in the ESM context, uh, parabolic antennas that mechanically move underneath the dome uh, are, are still around, but they've been largely replaced by phase arrays, phased arrays, which have a lot of uh, antenna elements on a panel, and a certain number of them are energized in such a way to form a beam uh, that, uh, uh, that points where you want. Uh, this is now relatively standard practice uh, for fixed satellite earth stations in motion. Uh, and that type of platform is essentially how one gets uh, broadband services on uh, an airplane. Um, you know, with your, if, if you subscribe to Wi-Fi on uh, your airline, you are likely going through a satellite, quite possibly uh, one that belongs to our company or our uh, one of our competitors, perhaps Viasat or SES or Intelsat or so forth. Um, this has become such a standard in the eSIM context that they recently changed the rules for GSO eSIMs, uh, which were written in the days of mechanical pointing, uh, and they've changed them to essentially have a beam forming standard. Uh, and the same concept is being uh, developed rapidly and perfected for terrestrial use as well. Uh, Ted Rappaport at NYU and 9NB uh, has uh, been on the front lines of this work and it's uh, quite significant work. So phase arrays are not new, uh, but they've, uh, and they've largely been confined thus far to specialty markets, uh, commercial aircraft and military. These things have not yet reached the economy of scale uh, where uh, they might be available for uh, a large number of earth stations and household user equipment. Uh, cost per unit has been a reason for limited use, and uh, you know, it, it, there are is always an economies of scale problem. Uh, it is uh, hoped that with the interest and investment in uh, NGSO constellations, uh, that uh, one or more of them will have enough of an audience to uh, bring the price point uh, down to where uh, the economics make sense. So what are the lessons for amateur satellite work? Well, we get along doing what we do quite fine. Uh, there's a pedagogical purpose for uh, correcting for Doppler, whether computer-aided or manually, uh, that is one of the very reasons why we exist. There is value in doing things uh, for lack of a better term, relatively low tech. Um, on the other hand, commercial NGSO constellations are going to be planned with dozens to hundreds of satellites. We should be lucky to have such a scale. Uh, and we handle the terrestrial compatibility issues in a different manner. Uh, one of which we have a lot of influence, if not a, lo a lot of control. Uh, there have been reports from time to time recently of uh, DMR interference uh, into, uh, say, one of the uh, Fox fleet. Uh, Paul recently posted a uh, note to various bullet boards, got some press with ARRL, saying, hey, there is an amateur satellite band, the band plan exists for a reason, please knock it off. And, we have some influence, uh, but the, um, you know, we're not going to have, we can't have, well, we might have influence over our own community. It is a little bit more difficult to have influence over consumers using things in the field. So it, it takes a different way. That said, there's no reason that the techniques uh, uh, we're talking about here can't be used in the amateur satellite service if the opportunity presents itself. I was listening to Paul's talk about L090 uh, while I was still in my hotel room finishing up some work. Uh, and he brought up the possibility of having multiple channels on uh, future amateur fleets, and those channels have to be assigned somehow, and Doppler and tracking has to be taken into account. Uh, the radio amateur is progressive. These are th not things to fear. 
they are not things which we might have cause to adopt today, but they might be things that we want to think about as we look to tomorrow. And that's it. I realize it wasn't very technically in depth, but it's some things that uh, some people in my industry are thinking about and perhaps whose value are thinking about as well. Thank you for listening. Brennan, in one of your slides you got an acronym ESIM. I missed what that is. Uh, yes, I'm sorry about that. Um, an ESIM is an Earth Station in Motion. Uh, it is um, uh, let's talk to you a little bit about. Uh, the, the history of why the satellite services, how the satellite services got fun as they did. Uh, just as there is a fixed service and a mobile service, there is a fixed satellite service and a mobile satellite service. Uh, when the services were defined, it was anticipated that mobile applications would happen in the mobile satellite service. But it's not, uh, you know, the, the way uh, uh, our Echostar Mobile Division, which is in Europe, has a mobile satellite service uh, spacecraft that operates in the S band, uh, the commercial parts of the S band. And uh, the model there is essentially uh, a, a cell phone sized transmitter with a very small antenna, but a really, really, really huge deployable uh, parabolic uh, reflector so that you make up for the inefficiency on the user equipment side with a uh, Huge with a huge antenna on the spacecraft. Um, that is fine for narrowband voice and uh, narrowband data, but for broadband uh, applications, it, it was found that you needed more spectrum and some more flexibility. So rather than try to redefine the fixed satellite service as or add an allocation to the mobile satellite service in these bands. Uh, the argument was made, look, fixed satellite service can provide the capacity. Uh, maybe we just need to alter the rules to allow the stations on the Earth to move. Uh, and that's been worked on through several WRCs at the ITU, uh, through several rounds of rulemaking over the last few decades uh, at the FCC. Uh, and they recently consolidated the rules for three types of Earth stations in motion. Uh, ESVs, or stations for vessels, it's boats, boats. ESAAs for the stations aboard aircraft, and uh, BMESs, which were vehicle-mounted Earth stations. Uh, all used the same technology. There was no reason to draw a distinction in most cases between the three. So that's what he's saying. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Need to go ahead? Sorry. Let's take that one more quick question right there. What uh, frequency bands are being considered for these commercial services, multi fleets, and how much antenna gain are you talking about? We are, uh, I, I, in order to answer you how much antenna gain are we talking talk about the precision of the decimal, I would need to look at the applications uh, for uh, the systems. Uh, as far as the bands that are in consideration, uh, broadband services are uh, essentially focusing on the uh, commercial KA band, uh, 27.5 to uh, 30 gigahertz rail link, corresponding downlink band as well. Uh, there's some carve-outs in there for uh, the Iridium slices around uh, uh, 29 gigahertz. Uh, also looking at uh, what we call the V and Q bands. These are, this is not the amateur V band at 146 gigahertz. <coughs> uh, we're uh, looking at uh, essentially 48 to 50 uh, gigahertz off and 4042 down, uh, at least here in the Americas. Changes a little bit uh, from place to place in the world because they, uh, uh, they couldn't really agree on a global solution for where uh, next generation satellite services ought to be across all three ITU regions. So that's what it is in the Americas. Slight differences also. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next presenter is John Kinney. Where's John? This will be about experimental satellite antenna.
John here. Okay, Dan, are you ready? Okay, we'll we'll get to um, we'll get to John Henry later. So here is Dan Schultz going to talk about deactivating the Kuiper Belt radio communications at the edge of the solar system. And as New Horizons was being assembled, 
Uh, they managed to stick one of the not yet explored postage stamps on the side of the spacecraft, just to stick it to the post office. <laughs> so this is the best Hubble photo of Pluto. Uh, taken in 2009. This is heavily processed by computer processing. That's not the raw data. I may have been on duty when that was shot. And about a 25% chance that I was. I was not involved at all in the New Horizons Pluto flyby, and I was tempted to skip that part. But in honor of my coworkers who were there, uh, one more plug for Hubble. Uh, we found Nixon Hydra in 2005 using our brand new advanced camera for surveys, which had been installed a couple of years earlier. And so Charon was discovered in 1978, and two more candidate satellites in 2005, and actually two more satellites in subsequent years. But I. Uh, New Horizons eventually got launched uh, in 2006. Uh, it was the fastest object ever to leave Earth. It reached Jupiter only 13 months later. It took nine and a half years to get to Pluto. And then its next target is a little tiny rock that's been called Ultima Thule. Wasn't the name I would have picked, but they had a contest and this one won. I rather like one of the other proposals was an Italian word that referred to a small frozen dessert following the main course. Um, the gravity from Jupiter cut three years late, three years travel time off of the flight, getting there in nine and a half years to Pluto. New Horizons is a small, austere spacecraft. It has no moving parts. The entire spacecraft must turn to point the instruments at the target, which means that we can't be in contact with the spacecraft while it's shooting pictures. And given the fact that the round trip light time is about 11 and a half hours uh, between sending a command and seeing it verify, uh, New Horizons pretty much needs to execute the entire encounter sequence without any help from the ground. Uh, APL is very good at building autonomous space vehicles. Um, one of the instruments is a long-range reconnaissance imager. It's an 8-inch F12 telescope with a 1,000 by 1,000 pixel CCD. We use it to take long-range optical navigation images because we don't really know the orbit of our target all that well. So we. Every couple of days we shoot another image and the navigation team pours over it to see if they can figure out if we're going to hit the target or not. It's also being used to take images of other distant objects that are one or two AUs away, which doesn't show you a lot of detail, but it gives you a light curve at a higher phase angle than is possible from the Earth. Coincidentally, my backyard telescope is also an 8-inch. It's only an F6. but Lori is about the same size as, the, as my own telescope. An instrument called ALICE is an ultraviolet spectrograph that took data on the structure and composition of Pluto's atmosphere. I don't think ALICE actually stands for anything. It's a variation of an instrument that flew to the, uh, on the Rosetta mission to explore a comet a couple of years ago. At uh, Ultima Thule, it will map the surface composition looking for frozen methane, frozen CO2, ammonia, and other stuff that shows up in UV. Another instrument is called RALPH, and I don't know what that stands for, but uh, old timers know the reference between RALPH and Alice. I had to explain this to some of the kids. Um, this takes all the visible images or at least the color images. Lori is strictly a black and white camera. So they reached Pluto in July 2015. They discovered the solar system's largest glacier. They found that the geology was much more interesting than they thought it would be. 
with methane ice and nitrogen snow and a red polar cap on Charon. And there's a view looking back showing Pluto's mountains. So now that's the night side of Pluto showing the light from scattered from Pluto's atmosphere, which is about one one hundred thousandth the pressure of Earth's atmosphere is ten microbars or one pascal. Earth's atmosphere is a hundred thousand pascal. The entire trip through the Pluto system after traveling for nine and a half years, these uh, yellow points in here are hourly tick marks. So you can see they flew through the Pluto system in about four hours. And given that the round trip light time was somewhere around nine or 10 hours at that point, uh, it, the spacecraft doesn't get any help from Earth because by the time it phones home with a problem, it's already sailed on. And we only get one chance to do an encounter. There's no do-overs. So everything has to work the first time. What's next for New Horizons? Well, after leaving Pluto, when Voyager flew by Neptune in 1989, they did not know that the Kuiper Belt existed. The first Kuiper Belt object was discovered from Mauna Kea in Hawaii in 1992. And then a whole series of other objects were added. So now we know that there's a second asteroid belt beyond the orbit of Neptune, and Pluto is just one member of that belt. So the question is, do you want your fourth grader to have to memorize 40 or 50 planets for their final exam? Uh, so they, the reason they demoted Pluto was to try to keep the solar system down to a manageable number of planets. So I hope that every third or fourth grader out there thanks us. Uh, Neil, Neil deGrasse Tyson was behind the demotion, and he still gets hate mail from elementary school. <laughs> So in 2014, the New Horizons team applied for time on Hubble and was granted time to search for new objects that New Horizons might visit. And after a suitable amount of searching, they found several potential targets, one of which was designated 2014 MU69, which is still the official name for Ultima Thule. Uh, several targets were ruled out because they would require a large amount of fuel. Uh, this was the least energy intensive target. The, 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 tra the trajectory of New Horizons can only be bent by less than a degree with the amount of fuel that remains on board. This will also be the first time that a spacecraft has visited an object that was discovered after this mission was launched. Kuiper Belt is named after Gerald Kuiper who was a Dutch-American astronomer who made most of the early discoveries of the planets and taught most of today's planetary astronomers. An artist's conception, we don't really know what it looks like. We, we do know that it's the most distant primitive object ever explored. This is the most distant attempt to do a flyby encounter. It's about 20 to 30 kilometers across, and it's called a cold classical Kuiper belt object because, not because of the temperature, but because it's in a circular, low inclination orbit that suggests that it has not been disturbed since the formation of the solar system. It's never been heated. And they've taken some data with stellar occultations in South America and Africa in the last couple of years that suggests it may actually be a binary object or something stuck together. This is the first image of the target taken in August uh, by the long-range imager from the spacecraft. And the left photo is the crowded star field. We're looking towards Sagittarius, which is the center of the Milky Way, which means we have a lot of stars to sort through. The right image is a difference between two successive images, and you see most of the stars subtract out. There's one object in the center that moved in between exposures, which is the same way that Clyde Tombach discovered Pluto. Look for the object that moves. Communications. None of this would be possible without the deep space network. 
Uh, radio technology supports new horizons, of course, by communicating with the spacecraft, by navigation through ranging. They transmit PN coded ranging signals up to the spacecraft, and we measure the time delay. The Deep Space Network defines two way ranging as you send a signal up and receive it back down through the same dish that sent it up. We don't do that anymore because the Earth rotates in between the transmit and receive time. So we do what they call three-way ranging, where Goldstone sends a signal up and Canberra receives the ranging signal 11 hours later. There's also a technique using VLBI, we call diff Delta Differential One-Way Ranging. Two different DSN stations record an unmodulated carrier signal from New Horizons and sound nearly simultaneous observations of quasars. And JPL has a very, very accurate quasar map. Using long baseline interferometry, they can determine the spacecraft position on the sky at 400 micro arc seconds, which is about 14 kilometers at 43 astronomical units. <laughs> <laughs> the third way that radio helps us is that radio does science. Uh, very powerful unmodulated carriers are sent up from the deep space network. During the flyby there will be five or six antennas on different continents transmitting unmodulated carrier signals partially for redundancy. There's a special receiver on board New Horizons that will pick up the reflection of that signal from the target. This was used to measure the atmospheric density during the Pluto flyby. It will be used to measure the surface temperature ultimately <coughs> to possibly detect any atmosphere that it might be outgassing, which I'm guessing it won't be. Uh, previous missions used the downlink signal. Voyager used its downlink to probe the atmospheres of all the planets that it flew by, but New Horizons is so far out that we have to use many. The Deep Space Network typically transmits 18 kilowatts. Uh, there's one antenna that has an 80 kilowatt transmitter, and we just need the extra power to make that long distance. Communicating with such a tiny object across the solar system seems to me to be a violation of common sense. Uh, you shouldn't be, this thing's about the size of your car, and it's four billion miles away, and I think it's just a miracle that we can hear it at all. If you go back to 20th century science fiction, all those stories were about manned missions going to the planets. They had to return to Earth to report their findings to the public. Because nobody imagined that you could build a robot spaceship, send it on a one-way mission, and receive the data by radio across the solar system. The 70-meter antenna at Goldstone is almost large enough to play football on. That's how it compares to the Rose Bowl. Um, when I worked on Hubble, the data came down at 32 kilobits per second almost continuously. It was like drinking from a fire hose. The data from New Horizons dribbles down one packet at a time. And it uses a packet telemetry system uh, defined by the CCSDS. The packets can come down in random order. The, the telemetry doesn't come down in a predictable way. It requires a different mindset than working on Hull. So this is one of the smaller antennas at Goldstone. This is a 34 meter antenna. They have four of these at each location. There's a website you can visit. They, this is in the proceedings. Uh, this shows you the current status of the DSM and what it's tracking. New Horizons on here is labeled NHPC, which stands for New Horizons Pluto Charon. So whenever you see this page tracking NHPC, that's us. And you can find that URL in your proceedings. The closest approach to this object occurs on New Year's Day, nine weeks from now. 12.33 in the morning. 
that we will be out of contact with the spacecraft at that time. The phone home event will occur about 10.05 to 10.30 in the morning. And we expect the first couple of images to come down around 6 p.m. That's called the New York Times photo because that's the one that will be on the cover of the New York Times. On January 1st, the round trip light time will be 12 hours, 16 minutes, and 4 seconds. This is the most distant flyby encounter ever to be attempted at 43 astronomical units, 43 times the distance from Earth to the Sun. The downlink rate at that distance is about 1,000 bits per second. It will take more than a year to get all of the recorded data off of the solid state recorder, which is 64 gigabits, not bytes, bits. If you divide that by eight, it works out to eight gigabytes, which is smaller than the thumb drive that I have in my pocket. But remember, New Horizons is 15-year-old technology, and how big was your thumb drive 15 years ago, assuming that you even had one? There is not enough electrical power from the RTG to run everything on the spacecraft. During the encounter phase, we can only run one of the traveling wave tube amplifiers, and I know traveling wave tube amplifiers are a bit dated, but this was 15 years ago, and that was what they had. They carried two of them for redundancy. After launch, they worked out a plan that they could run both of the tweeters at the same time to double the bit rate, but we can't do that and run the IMU and run all the science instruments. So after the encounter, New Horizons will go back to spin phase for several months. We turn off the IMU. That allows us to run both tweeters to get pretty much twice the data rate. I should mention there was an anomaly on the spacecraft on July 4th, 2015, which was 11 days before the Pluto encounter. The onboard computer was compressing images to store them on the solid state recorder when it got overloaded. It had too many tasks running. It switched to the backup computer, which caused the downlink signal to shut off, which caused immense panic in the control room. And I wasn't there for that, but one of the stories I heard about, that for several days they had to rebuild all the command loads and get the spacecraft online. And remember, there's only one chance to do this. There's no do-overs. So they, they published papers about the July 4th anomaly. One of them is referenced in the proceedings. The distance from Ultima Thule will be 3,500 kilometers, which means that the object will be about half a degree in diameter, which is coincidentally about the size of the moon appears in our sky but the sun out there is 900 times fainter, which is 11.8 f-stops if you're a photographer. They planned an alternative trajectory that flies by at 10,000 kilometers if the long-range images show evidence of a dust cloud or other hazards. That decision is made in mid-December. To make things more fun, we will be close to solar conjunction. The Earth will be on the opposite side of the sun from Ultima Thule, which means the signal will pass through the sun's corona. <laughs> this is a secondary target, and we didn't get to choose the encounter date. The velocity, heliocentric velocity, in reference to the sun is 14 kilometers per second, which means it could travel from here to Paris in eight and a half minutes. Uh, the Earth moves around the sun 30 kilometers per second, so at certain times in the year we're actually catching up to it and the Doppler shift is positive. <laughs> 8.4 gigahertz. I'm not allowed to say the exact frequency because they know you guys will try to... <laughs> <laughs> That's the downlink. The uplink is 7 point something or other. It's all X band. I guess if you have a 70 meter dish in your backyard, you're welcome to try it. <laughs> the um, traveling wave tube puts out 12 watts, which is 40 dBm. The high gain antenna adds 42 dBm. The path loss, minus 307. 
the 70 meter antenna has 74 dB gain, so we calculate a received signal power of minus 149 dBm. The signal that I see on the telemetry page is minus 157, which is 2 times 10 to the minus 19th watts, which if you're a physics nerd is about 1 electron volt per second. Uh, I've been having an email exchange with our RF engineer for the past week to figure out where the missing 7 dB went, and we're not sure we figured that out yet. I guess I'll chalk it up to implementation loss. Uh, we do turbo coding at rate 1.6. Uh, the EV over N naught threshold is about 0 dB. The receiver on the spacecraft is 0.8 dB noise figure at 7.4, I guess that's the uplink frequency. Uh, New Horizons carries an ultra-stable oscillator that APL designed and built and cost over a million dollars. Uh, this allows, this is enabling technology for the radio science experiment. Uh, block diagram of the RF system. If you're interested, there are papers that I referenced in the proceedings. Uh, the radio science experiment, uh, we have an uplink to the high gain antenna. The signals are, go through various IF amplifiers. A lot of the digital processing is done in FPGAs. This is the uplink card which contains signal processing circuits, an A to D converter, an Actel FPGA that implements regenerative PN ranging, not bent pipe ranging, but ABL invented. They, they regenerate the bits and retransmit them. They synchronize the downlink signal to the uplink signal, but it's not a simple bent pipe like every other spacecraft. And it's the front end for the radio science experiment. That's the block diagram of the card. If you want to know more, look at the IEEE papers that I referenced in the proceedings. This is the 2.5 meter high gain antenna with a Cassegrain feed. The Cassegrain secondary also doubles as the medium gain antenna, which is about 21 dB gain. On the left side, you see a low gain antenna that was used in the early part of the mission post launch checkout. It is completely useless at 43 astronomical units. We can communicate at, a very, at 10 bits per second using the medium gain antenna. Uh, we obviously prefer the high gain antenna. That's uh, New Horizons. Uh, on, I think they were measuring the mass on this shot at APL in Power County, Maryland. Uh, that's another shot of the antennas and the rest of the spacecraft under assembly uh, sometime around 2004, 2005. The radio isotope thermal electric generator is slowly decreasing over time. We have about 190 watts at the current time. The RTG converts 6% of the heat flow to electrical power. The rest of it gets dumped overboard through the radiators. Uh, the thermocouple junctions are not terribly efficient, but it's the only thing that works that far from the sun. The antenna elevation of the deep space network, the uh, system noise temperature gets higher as the antenna is pointed at lower elevations as we pick up more noise from the surrounding terrain. This has an effect on the downlink bit rate. We step the rates as the antenna elevation increases. We interrupt telemetry and switch to a higher bit rate when the antenna is at higher elevations. So if you look at our past plans, we have typically four or five intervals where we change the bit rate to follow the DSN antenna. Um, these are rain fades. This was actually over Canberra, but I was going to say it was Madrid so that I could refer to the rain in Spain. <laughs> These cause data dropouts, uh, missing packets, which we have to generate an uplink command to ask the spacecraft to replay the missing packets. Uh, eventually, at some point, the solid state recorder does get erased, but they check everybody on the team to see if they've got all their data. It requires a huge number of signatures 
to send the command to erase the solid state recorder. This is a rather dated photo of the primary mission operations center at APL in Maryland. Uh, I couldn't find a more recent photo that was approved for public release. We're not allowed to have cameras there. Uh, a large part of APL's work is stuff they don't talk about. So there's a general rule, no cameras. I know every cell phone has a camera, but I was told never to use it. Uh, that's a picture during the Pluto encounter. There's not, usually not that many people there. We typically have two flight controllers on each shift. And unlike Hubble, we don't hand over to an oncoming shift. We leave and shut down when the pass is over. And it might be a day before the next pass begins. It might be a few hours, but we don't typically see the oncoming shift. We leave notes for them to tell them what commands we sent and what time we expect the verification to come down. As we get closer to the encounter in the last two weeks of December, we will have 24-7 staffing and we will have a higher priority for the DSN. All of these missions, all of the deep space missions share the DSN. The project managers lock themselves in a room every couple of months and slug it out for who gets to use the antenna. Uh, the InSight mission is arriving at Mars in late November or December. I think OSIRIS-REx is arriving at its target pretty soon. So there's a lot of missions that want to use that antenna. And so it's a question of who is in the critical phase. We have a remote mission operations center at JPL, and I was out there three weeks ago. They sent four of us out there to exercise the remote console. If there should be some natural disaster that takes out APL, uh, the surviving flight control members are supposed to get in a van and drive to Pasadena. We're not allowed to fly. So, uh, I would have put it as Goddard, but they didn't ask my opinion. So we got to go out to uh, Goldstone when we were there. Uh, there is an error in this sign that Bob Bernanga pointed out to me. Um, 25. It says that there's, it moves on a thin film of hydraulic oil, 25 millimeters or 0 0.01 inch thick. Well, 25 millimeters is not 0.01 inches. Bob saw this and pointed it out. Uh, that's me at the, th this was a maintenance day. They weren't tracking anything the day that we were there. So all the antennas were pointing straight up. Um, our call sign on the voice loops is Pluto Ace. Um, all the missions are controlled by an ace. There's Opportunity Ace, there's Curiosity Ace, but New Horizons Ace would be too cumbersome, so they just call us Pluto Ace. There's a spacecraft that's actually called Ace, and I've been wondering what call sign they use. <laughs> uh, the wild girl population at Goldstone is not impressed by any of this. When I got my pass to go on site, the guards warned me two things. Don't touch the burrows, they bite, and their mouths are so full of bacteria that if they bite you, you'll probably have to have your limb amputated. They also said don't pick up anything off the ground that you didn't drop because the Fort Irwin is next door to Goldstone and it's sometimes used as a bombing range. And so there's a possibility of unexploded organs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The guards are issued one bullet per year as a Christmas present. Well, that was Goddard. I think at Fort Irwin they can have all they want. The <laughs> JPL guards. Yeah, but this isn't JPL. Uh, they have tank crossings. When you're driving around there, there's a sign that says tank crossing. And they have Jersey barriers that are along the side of the road, which I was wondering why they were there. I'm guessing that the tanks probably just drive right over them. 
I should mention that down the hall from my office at ABL, they have what they call the Legacy Bridge, which pretty much lists every employee who ever worked at ABL over the last 75 years. Bill Tynan's name is on the third row from the ceiling. Uh, if I was allowed to have a camera there, I would have taken a picture of it. I'm trying to figure out some way I can get a photo of that and send it to you. Uh, I didn't mention the safing system. On Hubble, we had the computer would go into safe mode if it detected an anomaly. Safing on Hubble means shut everything down, point the solar arrays at the sun to keep the batteries charged and wait for instructions from Earth. On New Horizons, it's a little bit different. You don't shut everything down during encounter mode and wait for instructions from Earth because by the time you get them, it will be too late. The saving system, which APL calls autonomy, is designed to isolate the fault and get back on the encounter timeline as soon as possible, because you only get one chance. I did have some career advice I was going to offer to the young people, but I don't see very many young people here, and that's a problem. I'll just mention that if I was running space camp, I would make the kids do critical design reviews and we'll see if they want to work for NASA after they've done a few of those. <laughs> so that's about all I have, if there's any questions. Phil. Uh, there's actually quite a bit about the telecommunication system on the JPL website. Yes, and I've referenced some of those papers in the proceedings. So if you really want to know a lot about the DSM, look at the papers I listed in the proceedings. Now, like is a 0.438 gigahertz, the uplink is 7182.043. <laughs> well, I know it's public knowledge, but my boss asked me not to say it, so I really like my boss, and I don't want to disappoint her. She is a remarkable person who proves that her name is Alice Bowman. And she proves that you don't have to be a jackass to be an effective manager. <laughs> yes. So, how much far do you think you're going to be able to maintain contact? You know, you're sort of thinking about the next target because you're like, hyper it seems like things are going to be. You know, you have more targets. But. Alan Stern thinks that we're going to find another target. I don't know how much time he's got on Hubble to look for another target. If we don't go to another target, we will do particles and fields measurements the same way Voyager does, and probably for another 10 years. The RTG is decaying. When New Horizons was built, there was a worldwide shortage of plutonium-238, and the RTE, RTG was not fully fueled. Uh, so it doesn't have the same lifetime that Voyager had. Um, and that's the other question. I've been hearing and reading about the shortage of 238. Did we still have a shortage of 238? Um, They were buying some from Russia. I don't know how that worked out. Um, you can Google it. You'll know as much as I do. I could point you to a large number of papers about the RTGs if you really want to know. Uh, they're all 10 or 15 years old. Our, the RTG is not going to last as long as the one on Voyager. Uh, the communication links may get spotty. I've seen estimates that it could go for another 10 years. They're trying to nurse Voyager along to get it to its 50th anniversary. Yes. So uh, when you use the two traveling waves to double the uh, double the bit rate, are you actually sending two signals and two frequencies? And no, they, they combine them. One is right-hand circular and one is left-hand circular. And the DSN has special equipment that sorts it all out. For ranging, we only use one of the polarizations, so the ranging signal is only half as strong as the data signal. Uh, it's all part of the magic of the DSN, which I can't begin to claim that I understand. They still have a few majors available, but most of the downlinks are supported by hemp amplifiers. 
it always impressed me that you could have an antenna the size of the Rose Bowl focusing energy on a hemp transistor the size of a flea. In the back. Do you know how fast New Horizons is going compared to the speed of uh, Voyager at the same distance? Voyager got a somewhat greater gravity assist from Jupiter. I don't know what its speed is, but I know that we're never going to catch up with it. Of course, we've got a 29 year head start. Uh, New Horizons is leaving the solar system at 14 kilometers per second. Another question? Uh, so you mentioned they, they schedule and they change the bit rate as a function of the elevation angle at the BSN. Is that something, given the 10-ish hour round trip time, is that all pre-planned? Yes, yeah, so it's in the command load. Okay. <coughs> we'll try to do a command load about every two weeks. We'll be sending them more frequently as we get closer to the target. Let's take so. one more and uh, we'll call Robert up. I noticed you were mentioning about the uh, Doppler shift going negative, and uh, I was wondering what was the range of the Doppler shift, um, and the confluence you said was where the Earth is here, the Sun, uh, the sun actually is going to be in the center, the Earth is going to be here, and uh, the spacecraft well, the flyby will occur on January 1st. Right. On January 3rd, we pass behind the Sun, which means there's no communication for about six days. So we're two days away from solar conjunction, and you know, if it was up to us, we would have chosen a different date. What, what about the uh, the uh, Doppler shift? That was very interesting to say that you know um, how much the Doppler shift is. Uh, I don't remember the actual numbers, but at certain times of the year, the Doppler shift goes positive because the Earth is catching up with new horizons. When we're on the part of our orbit where we're getting closer. Because we move 30 kilometers per second around the sun. And back in August, ADL launched the Parker Solar Probe. A lot of our people are dividing their time between New Horizons and Parker. And Parker just did its first Venus flyby, and they're going to get closer to the sun than anybody ever has before. They will become the fastest man-made object as they dip into the sun's gravity well. And the bit rate from Parker is also extremely limited. So answer to the question, 14 kilometers per second for New Horizons, 16.92 for Voyager. Okay, Voyager got a uh, better gravity assist than we did. We're never going to catch up with Voyager. I think we will pass the pioneers in about a century. The uh, third stage motor from the rocket is also leaving the solar system, but we're not tracking it, so we can only make a crude guess about where it is. And thank you. Very entertaining.